because all right i've started recording hello and welcome to part three of the sparking connections um series on autumn journal by louis mcneese hello welcome back if you haven't listened to the first two parts um this will not make a whole lot of sense without them so go listen to those uh, to, we'll jump straight into it. Today we are looking at the at Cantos thirteen to eighteen, mm. and it's all going to be in relation to an overall theme or an overall topic, which is the individual versus the collective, the awareness of yourself in relation to others. I feel like that is a topic that McNeese comes back to several times um within the poem as a whole but especially in these six cantos so canto 13 is about his university education so remember he went to um, oxford and studied classics so kim do you have any thoughts so far on this canto that you'd like to start with um, if I can remember what the canto was about, yes. Um, I mean, I sort of just got more of a, the sense of what, like, what he his opinions were on his teaching mm -hmm. and what he knows about and what he's actually teaching. Because the previous one, I think we talked about in the last. Uh, in the last episode, he, when he was talking about what he teaches, he was kind of like, uh, kind of brushed over it. Um, yeah. So this was a bit more informative, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so what sense did you get of his um, opinions then? Oh, gosh. Um, okay. <laughs> I think he, he's not taking what he knows for granted. In this one, definitely. Uh -huh. He... he enjoys his knowledge that he has um yeah. but i can't honestly think of what else i mean obviously there's okay. a lot of it that um that you annotated that i had to like read and and look at because oh, yeah, yeah. i'm not super informed on on the classics but um but yeah that's that's it okay I'd say, there are, I'd say you're right about him enjoying it. Mm. Uh, there was a, a line that I particularly liked, which I think is um, both quite sarcastic, but also actually um, is sort of like I related to it in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, when he says, uh, it really was very attractive to be able to talk about tables and to ask if the table is and to draw the cork out of an old conundrum and watch the paradoxes fizz. It's the watch the paradoxes fizz that I really like. It's that sort of like, we like this because it's fun, because we enjoy um, these thought experiments. Mm -hmm. It's this sort of, it's a spectacle almost to to watch someone or to listen to somebody go through um, these like philosophical conundrums and to to reach the end of a of an explanation and go and therefore nothing is real like it's just fun but it's also he's acknowledging how useless it is mm. that that is what it's for that like all the stuff we were talking about in the Borges episode about um idealism and you know the belief that like nothing exists in and of itself uh, everything just exists in our perceptions yeah and you know you get to the end of that and you're like therefore the real world or the, the physical world cannot be proven to exist and right. it's like okay cool um like that's a fun idea but what can you do with it? What do we do with that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of what McNeese is saying. But he's acknowledging that it's fun, that it's fun to watch the paradoxes is. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a, a line in Canto, let me find it, Canto 11, where he says, everything wrong has been proved. You know, it's been proved that 
Achilles cannot catch the tortoise. You know, he's throughout philosophy, there's all kinds of proofs about mm. all kinds of things. Doesn't mean that it's true in in the in our real lives, you know? Right, right. These philosophical arguments that don't really mean anything to us as people, they're just interesting thought experiments. And I think obviously I'm sure there are like Obviously, there is plenty of philosophy, especially more recent philosophy, that does have very legitimate impacts on the real world. Mm -hmm. But when Magnus is describing his education, he's basically saying, yeah, well, we learned all of this stuff and it was interesting and fun, but it has no bearing on the real right. world. Right. There's another very sort of sarcastic line. Um, I ought to be glad that I studied the classics of Marlborough and Merton. Not everyone here, having had the privilege of learning a language that is incontrovertibly dead. <laughs> <laughs> and again, having learned a tiny bit of ancient Greek uh, mm. in my first year of uni, uh, I can attest I have never used it like I enjoyed learning it. And it's occasionally fun to look at a, a modern word and know what it might mean based on its, based on its Greek etymology. Mm. That is the only way I have ever used this ancient Greek. <laughs> I don't regret learning it. I enjoyed it, but it's not. Um, it's even going to Greece now. It's knowing ancient Greek is not going to help. Not going to help. Yeah. <laughs> and unless you are um, heavily involved in, um, well, mostly Catholicism, you're probably not going to need Latin either. <laughs> no. Maybe, I mean, people argue that you can use it for science, but it's not super essential. Yeah. Certainly not the, the kinds of um, grammatical stuff that no. Rodney talks about at various points. No, definitely not. And so he sort of um, talks about the, you know, we wrote compositions in Greek, which they said, presumably the, the, his teachers, mm -hmm. was a lesson in logic and good for the brain. Okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, use, uses sort of military metaphors again. We marched, mm. countermarched to the field marshal's blue pencil baton. We dressed by the right and we wrote out the sentence again. <laughs> and, you know, the nobody, we learned that nobody knows how to speak, much less how to write English, who was, who was not hobnobbed with the great grandparents of English. Which again, basically, he was taught, oh, you can't write English properly unless you know Latin, right. which is ridiculous. And that's where a lot of um, grammatical stuff now comes from, when it's like, oh, you can't split infinitives. Mm. You, you, you know, you can't say to boldly go, has to be to go boldly, because you can't do it in Latin. I think right. it was Dryden, but I, I could be wrong. Um, so 18th century, I think, possibly 16th, no, either, either 17th or 18th who said, who basically came up with that rule. It was like, you can't do it in Latin, so I'm not going to do it in English, which, yeah, that's it's just ridiculous. Get out of here, um, Latin. We don't need you right this moment. <laughs> yeah, English is a different language, had you not noticed. Um, <laughs> Did you realise? And so yeah. that's why when he says, who was not hobnobbed with the great-grandparents of English, that, like, you know, burdened, essentially. Mm. So if we look at the... Um, the question that I originally sort of posed about the relation of, of people to others. Is there anything that you would say about this one? Um, relationship to others? Yeah. Or place in society, that sort of, that sort of topic. Mm. I guess he, it's back to that kind of, um, like he's had experiences that are sort of more um, privileged than others. So he's learning, mm -hmm. he, he has the ability to learn stuff that other people don't really need to know. And yeah. I think he knows that. And he's like, that's what I think where the sarcasm is coming from is he knows it's not useful and he knows that, mm -hmm. you know, he's had the chance to learn it. And even though it isn't useful, he's still enjoying it and using it for now his job or... Yeah, yeah. I assume he was currently still in the job when he was writing this. Uh, I'm not sure, but 
possibly. Mm. Um, so yeah, definitely. And there's therefore that sense of elitism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he has been told that, so he, he acknowledges that he's, that not everybody had the privilege of learning Greek and Latin. Yeah. And then he writes that he was told that a gentleman never misplaces his accents. So ancient Greek is a language that has um, accents that determine how long uh, a vowel is. Right. Um, so basically, if you get that wrong, you're not a real gentleman. <laughs> um, which means that, therefore, he, get, he has been taught it correctly. He is a gentleman. All these right. other people who didn't go to his fancy school didn't, are, are mm -hmm. not gentlemen. Um, there's also a, some, some misogyny there that, you know, they're, that it's gentlemen, women don't even get the chance, mm -hmm. um, that nobody knows how to speak, much less to write English, who doesn't know Greek and Latin. Right. So you and I, we don't even know how to read and write English, honestly. Honestly. Um, the, the boy on the modern side is merely a parasite. I'm guessing like modern side of, um, like, like modern learning about modern philosophers and, and such. I'm right. guessing that's what he means there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, so th those people are merely parasites, you know, compared to McNeese and his cohort. You know, the classical student is bred to the purple, as in like the colour of royalty. Mm -hmm. um, definitely in ancient Rome, possibly later, I, I forget. So basically what he is saying is he has been taught that he is better than everybody else. Right. Because of where he went to school. Mm -hmm. And where he went to school is a product of being able to afford to go there. Right. Which are still more expensive than other universities. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a huge sort of um, benefit in terms of you are more likely to, although obviously now they are making an effort to have more students who didn't go to private schools. Yeah. You, if you could afford to go to a private school, you're likely to be being taught by teachers who went to Oxford and Cambridge mm. because those are the schools that can afford to pay people. Right. In that kind, you know, and you're more likely to also be able to afford private tutors and such, and therefore be able to afford like, but therefore have a better chance of getting in in the first place. Right. So essentially he's been taught that he's better than everyone else because he's richer than them. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like you could afford to get into this school. Therefore, you could afford to be taught this stuff. And being taught this stuff means you are just inherently cleverer and smarter and more like sort of... What's the word? Like, th there's almost a moral thing. Right. Like, he sort of, you know, there are... Especially with... Um, the canto where he's talking about his like school education mm -hmm. you know he when he says that uh learning greek and latin was treated as a moral education as well right um so he's basically being taught you are better than better than those plebs in every way <laughs> <laughs> which obviously all of the the sarcasm in this canto is suggesting that he does not agree with, but it's right. still the belief system um, that he was brought up with, right? Yeah, From yeah. Marlborough, where he started when he was 10, and then Merton Oxford. And this is, a, this is another bit of sarcasm that I like. Uh, I just want to point out before we move on. Mm. Um, so he's been saying, you know, um, talking about people like him who, once they have their degree, are stamped as a person of intelligence and culture. Um, and, um, you know, who don't have to worry about those silly things, other people, the unimportant problem of getting enough to eat. Right. Uh, and then says, so blow the bugles over the metaphysicians. Let the pure mind return to the pure mind. I must be content to remain in the world of appearance, so Plato, and sit on the mere appearance of a behind. <laughs> <laughs> but it does show, it does sort of show just how um, useless he's implying that this, 
this type of philosophy is that like mm. you know it it's all of this still exists even if plato says it doesn't basically right, right. and even if it even if it truly doesn't exist we have to go about life assuming it does because it doesn't work you can't live thinking that everything doesn't exist right so the next um canto is a very uh is a quite a big contrast so this one shows i'd argue he's talking about a time in which he was taught to have a, a lack of awareness or a lack of sort of sensitivity about the self in relation to others you know mm -hmm. he's told you're better than them um and the effect of that is that you don't care about the ordinary people right um canto 14 is about the oxford by-election <laughs> which is a, a quite a boring topic for poetry one mm. would think but he does he does uh, make an interesting point so this election was forced on the issue of appeasement so it is relevant to um it, it, it was so it was important in the context of you know this this war that had begun at this point a couple months ago mm. and yes so in this canto he's talking about um or he is remembering going to uh, oxford to vote in this election right and the He's sort of um, talking about people who argue that voting is unimportant. I'm seeing a lot of uh, discussion about this at the moment with obviously upcoming elections um, in yeah. America, people saying, well, you know, I don't like any of these parties, so why am I, why would I vote for any of them? Mm. Or people wanting to abstain from voting. And McNeese sympathizes with that position. Right. Um, basically saying, you know, You know, suggest those people saying, um, or is it, is our only ready weapon, um, remembering that this crude and so-called obsolete, top-heavy, tedious parliamentary system is our only ready weapon to defeat the legion, the legion's eagles and the lictor's axes, and remembering that those who, by their habit, hate politics, can no longer keep their private values unless they open the public gate to a better political system. That mm -hmm. Rome was not built, built in a day is no excuse for laissez-faire, for bowing to the odds against us. What is the use of asking what is the use of one brick only the perfectionist stands forever in a fog waiting for the fog to clear better to be vulgar and use your legs and leave a blank for hog and put across the lindsay so quinton hogg was the conservative candidate and mm -hmm. sandy lindsay was the uh, it was an independent progressive and hog won um so what he's saying you know he he's acknowledging the that sense of hopelessness that like right people would say well this is one tiny thing and he's saying but one you, when you're building a wall you don't say what's the point of this one brick yeah and you know that's sort of his um his position that's very sort of different to where he's sort of in other places in the poem sounded a little bit sort of hopeless about it mm. You know, I think in, I think it was in the first part we were talking about a, a, a canto, some lines in which he's talking about essentially alluding to his sort of friends and colleagues who are very strongly socialist or communist. And right. he's kind of saying, you know, essentially that it doesn't come as naturally to him to feel that strongly about his, about his sort of beliefs mm -hmm. and that he's, a, he's less confident in those things actually happening. Yeah. You know in those systems being able to be brought about and mm. here he's possibly in in the wake of the beginning of a war he's kind of going mm. well i have to do the small thing i can do yeah that said at the end of that um canto I stop the car and take the yellow placard off the bonnet. That little job is done, though without success or glory. Right. It didn't work, but he doesn't regret doing it anyway. 
Is there anything about that canto that you want to ask about or point out or anything? Mm. I mean, I think it's interesting that he drove all that way just to vote in a by-election that he wasn't even mm -hmm. sure would be, like he wasn't even sure there would be a point. I think it definitely yeah. speaks to the fact that he's like, I have to do something, you know, whether it's small or not. Um, but yeah, the fact that it didn't make a difference is kind of like, mm. I feel like a, a way that many people feel about voting. Yeah, so definitely. It's definitely like one of the more, even though obviously in the previous one, he was talking about experiences that were very unrelatable to a lot of people. This, uh, this canto is, everything's much more relatable. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think there's also the sense that, a sense that sort of gradually develops over the course of the poem. Mm -hmm. of doing the moral thing because it's the moral thing right. rather than for for an end result um that is he is voting for the party member who he thinks is sort of at at worst sort of the lesser of two evils i don't again i don't know for sure right how strongly he was in support of um lindsay but certainly thought that Lindsay was better than Hogg, so mm. he's going to make this decision regardless of whether it's going to have any effect in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. That he's saying this is the right thing to do in itself rather than for an end result. But it is all... <sighs> the, the act in and of itself may not have an impact, but it is, it's, it's the right thing to do in itself because of the potential impact. Right. Is sort of what he's aiming for. I'm not quite sure how to phrase that because mm. he, it's not that he's not considering outcomes. It's that he's looking at a grander outcome mm. and trying to achieve that rather than, rather than worrying about this individual thing. Like yeah. this individual election may not affect him all that much. He's already mentioned, um, you know, he's, he's remembered when he was teaching at Birmingham and there was mm. a... Um, you know, there was another election, Labour was defeated, and life went on. You know, for him, mm. went on as always. The same yeah. could happen here, although it is um, a bigger deal, because it's more directly related to the war. Mm. <laughs> um, right. As everything um, at this point in time is related to the war, because... It's quite a big deal. <laughs> I also think it's interesting that of all the things he could have talked about, he chose like this specific instance of him driving mm -hmm. miles to vote is the one that he decided to write about. Yeah. And, like yeah. It, it was clearly very um, impactful for, <clears throat> for him. <clears throat> right, yeah, because it's sort of an important one and perhaps it's one that he felt really strongly about. Mm. Sort of, you know, that he had to think think hard about and kind of go, is it going to make a difference? I, whether it's going to make a difference or not, I've got to do it anyway. That's the right thing. And then right. it doesn't, it yeah. doesn't work. But he still feels he's done the right thing anyway by, by trying, by making right. his voice heard just in case. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, with these things, you know, the thing with that sort of politics is that you vote, you can vote somebody like, even if the person you vote for didn't get in, the people who did get in are still aware of how many people voted for their opposition. Right. And are likely to, uh, to take that into account. Yeah, or definitely. Hopefully take that into account. So, you know, there's that kind of practical aspect of it too. Right, pause so, one second. I need to shut my door. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So the next canto... Um, is a strange one mm -hmm. and I don't really know what to make of it so I'd like to hear your thoughts on this one it's one that I've listened to you know the um rephrase that it's one that I've read quite a lot of times mm -hmm. and I'm still not a hundred percent sure sort of oh, who precisely yeah. he's talking about so this is the one in which he is, it begins, Shelley and jazz and leader and love and hymn tunes and day returns too soon. 
who will get drunk among the roses in the valley of the moon. And is sort of talking about all of these sort of sensual pleasures that he is sort of indulging in. Mm. And he goes, he goes on for quite a long time about that. And then says, oh, look who comes here. I cannot see their faces walking in file, slowly in file. They have no shoes on their feet. The knobs of their ankles catch the moonlight as they pass the stile and cross the moor among the skeletons of Bob Oak, following the track from the gallows back to the town. Each has the end of a rope around his neck. I wonder who let these men come back, who cut them down. And then he goes on to, to ask, where have we seen them before? Why do they look familiar? Mm-hmm. Was it the murderer on the nursery ceiling or Judas Iscariot in the field of blood or someone at Gallipoli or in Flanders? So he's referencing obviously the Bible and then the First World War. Mm-hmm. And then basically says, take no notice of them, out with the ukulele, the saxophone and the dice. They're sure to go away if we take no notice. So then they they won't go away, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Um, but so clearly this is something that, and he's saying we, so clearly this is something that sort of collectively everyone is trying to not think about. Right. And the... Um, you know, sort of the metaphor of let's carry on with our party and ignore the ghosts mm-hmm. is, you know, for let's carry on with sort of focusing on focusing on fun things, focusing on sensual things in order to not deal with this, this yeah. problem, in order to not worry about this. Um, I want to say guilt. I feel like it's guilt that's haunting them. Mm. Maybe survivor's guilt. But, Possibly, yeah. But are these people already dead? I guess mm, maybe... To me, I feel like it's... Like you're trying so hard to distract from the reality of what's going on and, and to ignore sort of the the writing on the wall in terms of mm. you know all the death and things that is gonna result out of this sort of turbulent time yeah although um london had had a hanging gate right it had a i think so it was at like the river line i believe um mm. they would t- take a boat into this like little channel and there was like a gallows there so i do wonder if maybe because people did used to watch hangings and I don't know mm. when I can't recall when they actually stopped or when they were stopped becoming a public spectacle. Yeah. Um, but I guess there's also that aspect of like seeing people that you know are going to, to die and like, mm. you know, there's not necessarily a survivor's guilt from that, but there's, there is a sort of, um, in the moment you're you're in it and you're like yes this is totally fine this is what our government does and they hang people but like if you take a step back from it which i think he is kind of being forced to do he realizes that it's actually like you know kind of weird and people like do i know these people and you know what like can i distract myself from what's actually going on Mm. that's interesting i think definitely um so definitely hanging would have stopped quite a long time before this. Mm. But as a, as a metaphor, it could certainly be the, the things that your government has done that you mm-hmm. don't want to think about. So, yeah, metaphorically, the people hung at the gallows, more literally, potentially... Um, disagreeing with what um, well I suppose there's also there's the um, there's Britain's response to Germany there's us going to war with Germany and knowing that we are therefore sending a whole bunch of young men to die and you know something about their faces is familiar well either it's because he they are they, they are people he knows who are going to die mm-hmm. or you know, where he then mentions first the First World War, maybe it is, you know, as he says right, to, right near the beginning, it has happened like this before. You know, we've had the First World War. 
or we didn't, or rather we had the war, the, the war to end all wars. Is it going to happen again? Like, seriously? Like, you're letting this happen again? Right. You know, maybe that's what it is. But, and so maybe that sense, because the feeling that I always get from this is guilt. I always feel like it's guilt that's haunting him. And maybe it is guilt, sort of collective guilt, that we're letting this happen again. Mm-hmm. Um, And like, because later on, you can't step into the same river twice. So there can't be ghosts. Thank God that rivers always flow. Um, so the, that's from uh, Heraclitus's philosophy. So it's more, more Greek stuff, mm-hmm. basically saying um, that, so it's, it's often used to mean that everything is changing, that sort of you'll never you never experience the same day more than once, but yeah. based on um, the Stanford like dictionary of or Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the message is not that all things are changing so that we cannot encounter them twice, but that some things stay the same only by changing. Um, and so maybe that's kind of what's what he's saying that things have changed and things have changed, but they've stayed the same in the sense that we're still sending people off to die in wars. Right. Maybe that's it. And same if you, um, this idea is then mentioned by Melanie White in a 2009 essay. These lines illustrate McNeese's contrary use of the flux to represent the linear passing of time and energy, energia, energia, I'm not entirely sure how you say that word, to focus on the actual as a vertical moment in time suspended over chronology, while the flux is a metaphor, energia is a matrix that enables McNeese to rethink the present. So it's a kind of, that that idea basically, of the linear passing of time, but things are kind of staying the same in a a sense. Mm -hmm. And, this sense of things staying the same only by changing. Um, that the the actual is the is the constant state of becoming. It's it's kind of hard to explain, but that's kind of what he's saying, right? Mm-hmm. Sufficient to the moment is the moment. Past and future merely don't make sense. And yet I thought I had seen them. But how if there is only a present tense? How is he worrying about the future? How is he traumatized by the past if he if only now exists, well, it's because mm. it, that isn't how it works, because right. time, the way that we experience time isn't, the, isn't one thing after another. We experience the guilt of things that have happened, the guilt of things that could happen, in, in this case, guilt, um, or fear of things that could happen. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess it's also an aspect of, like, he can't control any of this. He's at mm-hmm. the whims of you know the government the people around him like he's not he's not able to step up and say and and also um yeah if you look at it in terms of the previous canto where he voted and it didn't work you know it's almost adding to that hopelessness like a stream of hopelessness yeah you know people are dying and and you can't do anything about it yeah totally so If you want, if we want to move on to the next canto, mm-hmm. which is a, it's the first time that we've really talked about Ireland. Mm. So, a sort of background to this, um, we acknowledged in the first um, uh, part of this series on Autumn Journal that McNeese was born in Ireland but moved to England for school when he was ten years old. Mm-hmm. And different writers have different takes on how Irish McNeese therefore is. I think Ireland, it was right. specifically Northern Ireland. So Melanie like, White says, <clears throat> it seems that McNeese wants to address mankind in general and not a specific national community, be it England or Ireland. It seems more easy and it seems more natural and easy for McNeese to forge a dialogue with Greek philosophers than with what he senses as a fake image of Ireland. So you'll see, um, in this canto, he describes uh, the the sort of romantic image of Ireland that I think a lot of people still have. Mm-hmm. Um, the linen mills, the long wet grass, the ragged hawthorn, um, these sorts of very pretty things. There's a bit later on, uh, he refers to, where is it? 
oh, maybe it's not in that one. Later on uh, in the poem, he refers to Tiananmen, which is fairyland, basically. Yeah. Um, and you know, he acknowledges these these things um, about. Um, here it is. Um, the perception of, of Ireland by the sentimental English as members of a world that never was baptised with fairy water. Right. And partly because Ireland is small enough to still be thought of with a family feeling. Uh, and because the rate waves are rough that split her from a more commercial culture. But then he acknowledges it's self-deception. There is no mm. immunity in this island either. A cart that is drawn by somebody else's horse and carrying goods to somebody else's market. So that it is basically capitalism is in Ireland too. <laughs> right. Um, and you know that this this island is like any other country. It mm. is a country with good things and bad things, with problems and you know things that make it a good place to live. Um, so this yeah, this image of Ireland it is fake. It is self deception. Um, so why says McNeese refuses on the one hand to be part of the national community of an island whose values he mostly rejects. While on, the other, he, while on the other, he likewise avoids being assimilated to the poetic generation of the 30s by, for, for instance, refusing his political involvement. Mm. Um, so, you know, George Hughes says that he, that McNeese thought of himself as Irish, um, but his writing does not attempt to disguise the disjunctions and dislocations which result from his complicated position. Mm -hmm. um, and that when we focus on such disjunction, Christ, and that when we focus on such disjunctions and dislocations, we find that his work reveals most clearly his Irish, expat Irish expatriation. Mm. Um, and also points out that Ireland is above all pictured intensely in terms of recollected personal experience. Um, and so basically that when he thinks of Ireland, he thinks of his childhood because that's where it was and so of course his sort of image of Ireland is not an image of like he's not remembering the bad parts or the complicated parts because he's remembering it as he was as it was when he was a child right so we can see whether that holds true Hughes is talking about his about Magnus's poetry as a whole we can see whether that holds true in in that canto mm -hmm. But um, sort of one sort of final opinion to consider, Dennis Donoghue, for example, has denied McNeese a place in the tradition of Northern Irish writing because he says his work touches Irish history and sentiment only occasionally and opportunistically. He mm -hmm. wasn't sufficiently interested in what was going on. And Hughes points out, this is not, it need hardly be said, how things seemed to McNeese himself. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially he is denouncing both sides of the sort of division between mm. um, Northern Ireland and uh, the Republic of Ireland and sort of the, you know, uni union, unionist versus nationalist, like that divide. Yeah. Um, so bearing in mind that this was written in the 30s, 1916, you had the Easter Rising Rebellion. Um, uh, violence, um, between 1916 and 1921, um, various complicated things um, politically in terms of part, people, you know, lots of people in Ireland wanting to be separate from um, Britain and yeah. also people who didn't, and a whole bunch of, of violence, um, the Irish War of Independence, um, which eventually led to the troubles in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And then more after that. Um, yeah. And so all of that is, all of that McNeese is aware of, right? Um, that, you know, he refers to the bombs in the turnip sack, the sniper from the roof, Griffith, Griffith Connolly, Collins, where have they brought us ourselves alone? Mm -hmm. um, basically, look at all of this violence, you know. Yeah. All this brought us is more violence. Mm. Um, so, but he's, he's not just denouncing one side. He isn't saying that the, he, he isn't saying, you know, the nationalists are wrong and Ireland should stay part of the UK. He's also not saying that the unionists 
are right. Yeah. Um, he's sort of acknowledging that both sides have points and that both sides have committed violence and um, kind of questioning his place. He says, why should I want to go back to you, Ireland, my island? Because yeah. his island is the island of his childhood, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, put up what flag you like, it is too late to save your soul with bunting. You know, regardless of whether you're part of, still part of Britain or not, there's been this horrific violence. Yeah. But I think it's pretty rich coming from someone who's not actually involved in it. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. Oh. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and that is kind of what... Um, yeah, I think it's pretty, well, I think yeah. it's like... I think it's like he he hasn't been there you know like it's all well and good him deciding to you know form say nobody's right but you know he doesn't live there anymore and he's not the one yeah. I get that he's like doesn't want the violence and stuff but you know he's not the one having to live through whatever regime they think is not the one that they should be living through or you know yeah, decisions yeah. like they're not his decisions to to be made yeah, you can absolutely take the, the Irish nationalist um, view and say, well, you moved to England. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you could almost see it as him betraying sort of his, his but not even But not even like the fact that he's um, moved to England. He, he could have moved anywhere and it's still oh, totally, not yeah. his fight anymore. Unless he wants right. to return to Ireland and, you know, and have a, an opinion on it. But, like, it's not, I don't know, you gave up your right to pass judgments when you decided that you didn't want to be a part of that place anymore. Mm. So mm. I think it's kind of... Although he moved so, so young, that did he really That's have... true. Like, obviously, I don't know. Maybe he mm. begged his parents to let him go to, to, to school in England. Maybe they decided it was... Yeah, maybe. He'd have more opportunity there. But he could um, have gone back or mm -hmm. had a stronger to connection to Ireland. Potentially, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say. Mm. Um, and, I, you know, <laughs> as an English person, I certainly don't want to sit here and say, oh, well, he wasn't really Irish or... or no, anything, no. You know, you know I, but I... Because it's I, not about whether, how I Irish he is, but it's the fact that, like, you can't pass judgments on violence, on decisions that you're... that don't affect you super personally. Like, he mm, yeah. decided to leave that argument and that, but he's still casting judgments on... Like, and that's just, you know, he's casting a fair judgment. He's saying, this side isn't right, this side isn't right. Like, it's balanced but yeah. but like yeah it kind of is like well you you left you gave up your right to be able to judge people on their views on for that aspect when you right distanced yourself from that place mm -hmm. it's the same way like like a lot of places will offer military aid or or peacekeeping and things like that to other countries and it's like it's not your fight though why are you getting involved mm. i understand yeah. like medical like like healthcare support and things like that yeah but like when you deploy people to other countries it's not your it's not your place to do that like right. unless someone specifically needs help but oftentimes it just makes it worse yeah it's different if they've requested it or right yeah I think the other, the other interesting thing about this is that he, he talks about what it's like, you know, he's obviously gone back to visit, right. um, you know, his family still live there. So he sort of said, the North where I was a boy is still the North, veneered with the grime of Glasgow, thousands of men whom nobody, nobody will imply, employ, thousands of men whom nobody will employ, standing mm -hmm. at the corners, coughing, and the street children play on the wet pavement, hopscotch or marbles. And so he's talking about, you know, it being sort of economically downtrodden and right. all of this. And like a disparity between the yeah. rich and the and poor. And he says, um, I hate your grandiose airs, your sob stuff, your laugh and your swagger, your assumption that everyone cares who is the king of your castle. The implication almost seems to be that it wouldn't matter whether they were still part of Britain or not, mm. because 
this is what Ireland sort of has become. This is what the violence has become. And right. I, again, I don't necessarily, he's not necessarily saying that the cause is a wrong or even the violence was unnecessary. Right. He's more just sort of, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a very ambivalent mm. section. I think that's the, that's the main thing. It's very ambivalent. He isn't, he's denouncing the violence on both sides and saying that he doesn't sort of have, he, he's refusing to pick a side in the same way yeah. as he's refused to outright call himself socialist mm. or anti-socialist. He's refused to outright denounce the communist and socialist views that the, a lot of the other 30s poets had while also refusing to say that he is or isn't against capitalism, right? Right. Which is interesting in relation to the canto about the Oxford by-election, where he did mm. pick a side, yeah. where he was forced to pick a side. But that was a very small time. Very... Mm, yeah. Yeah. Very, um, like... I don't know. I guess it would have an impact, but less of an impact than like whole countries and whole oh yeah, you know, counties fighting over. And also perhaps he felt more like he was forced to pick a side. Perhaps if he mm. lived in Ireland, he would feel more like he had to pick a side. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Interesting. So, yes, shall we move on to the next stanza which is let's and that which is the beginning it's the first one that mentions november mm -hmm. so that's where we are in time at this point and it's a whole bunch about aristotle which is great if you like aristotle not so great if you're less uh less interested in greek philosophy mm -hmm. so let me uh suggest these things let me today let me uh go through these a few quotes from an essay by james matthew wilson about the presentation of aristotle in um autumn journal so this is where the the main theme of this episode you know the self and the other and the personal and the collective mm -hmm. is sort of most overtly talked about so Wilson says that man, according to Aristotle, is a political animal. His identity can only be understood in relation to the polis. Um, and that's not necessarily that man forms governments, political parties, etc. by nature. Mm. It's that the unique characteristic of the human being without which he would no longer be human is his intrinsic relationship to the human community. Um, the society into which he is born confers identity on him and it is the complex or aggregate of roles he acquires over time that makes him intelligible to both himself and others. So that's where the line um, he is where is it? Here it is. So that's where, when he says, um, the ego cannot live without becoming other, for the other has got yourself to give. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, you know, the other, sort of the other person, but also the other people who are unlike you, mm -hmm. um, is you are, your, your identity is based on defining yourself with or against others. Um, so without other people, you would have no identity. Mm. And so, you know, Wilson talks about, um, I hate the way that Zoom works, it's so frustrating. Right. Um, he says, for, for McNeese to believe what Aristotle took passively as a given required a positive act of will. So there's the impact of um, Kant, German philosopher. Mm -hmm. uh, Wilson kind of says that Kant's sort of 
the Kant's philosophy has muddled the waters and made people take Aristotle, uh, like interpret Aristotle wrong. Right. Um, uh, so, but what Wilson attributes to Kant's influence, I think, can also be due to sort of capitalism, you know, sort of liberalism, mm -hmm. like with a capital L, the general trend towards individualism in society, mm -hmm. that we're trained to see ourselves as separate from the collective. Because Aristotle talks about this idea of like, you know, we are our moral actions, like morality comes from our relationship with other people and with the rest of the community. Yeah. And that we by nature build community. And mm -hmm. so what's good for you to do is what's good for everybody else. And that that's sort of just how, how we work as people. Yeah. Whereas Kant talks about duty and things being good in and of themselves, which is not what Aristotle meant, but it's what Wilson says people then, people then interpret Aristotle and that sense mm. of um, you being able to universalize maxims, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, because of Kant. But I think it can also be seen as just the way that our society works, that we are trained to see ourselves as individuals and not as part of a collective. Right. Um, it's, it's especially an American thing, but uh, it is prevalent here as well. Um, you know, that sense that we are all sort of unique and that we should be focusing on ourselves and on our families, but like yeah. specifically the nuclear family rather yeah. than the whole community. Um, so in this canto, it's interesting, he, you know, he begins sort of having breakfast and um, thinking about various things and then <laughs> says, we lie in the bath between tiled walls and under ascending scrolls of steam and feel the ego merge as the pores open and we lie in the bath and dream. He's having a very sort of philosophical train of thought <laughs> while Bye. in the bath. Um, and, you know, uses the um, water imagery to talk about Plato and Aristotle. But Plato was right to define the bodily pleasures as the pouring water into a hungry sieve but wrong to ignore the rhythm which the intercrossing coloured waters permanently give. So basically, you know, I, 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 I would take the, um, the hungry sieve metaphor to be that, you know, the more that you indulge your sort of bodily uh, desires, the more, the more you need them because you'll never get, you're never going to be satisfied. It's like pouring water through a sieve. Right. That it's perpetual. But the rhythm which the intercrossing coloured waters give is like the fact that just because you're never going to be satisfied doesn't mean that you can't enjoy it in the moment. It doesn't mean that it, like this sort of the, if you take the, the breakfast metaphor, you know, he's mm. eating breakfast at the beginning, just because you need to eat again later doesn't mean that you shouldn't eat now. And that's what gives you, right. that's, that's part of what gives rhythm to your life that there's, that we, you know, the sort of regular pattern of needing to eat, needing to sleep, mm -hmm. needing other people, needing this, needing that, that we keep going. Just because you can't ever be satisfied doesn't mean it's pointless. Right. Um, and yeah, Aristotle was right to posit the alter ego, but wrong to make it only a halfway house. Um, who could expect or want to be spiritually self-supporting? You know, that we are always in community. Why not admit that other people are always organic to the self, that a monologue is less the death, that a monologue is the death of language, and that a single lion is less himself or alive than a dog and another dog. Mm -hmm. So that again, the other has got yourself to give. You are you become who you are in relation to other people. And a monologue is the death of language. Writing should be or oh, language is for communication. If you're only talking to yourself, are you even talking? What's the right. point? Which is interesting, given that this is an extremely long poem. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. is arguably a monologue. <laughs> <clears throat> Which, 
makes me wonder who is this aimed at who is it that he's expecting to read this and what's mm. he expect how is he expecting them to take it is this you know is he anticipating dialogue i don't know what do you think about that or about this, the canto as a whole um i would say that it, whenever you make something like you say he was a writer he was in a community of writers i was i'm i'm guessing that he definitely was expecting dialogue yeah um and the note that he added also um but maybe in like counteracts that a little bit because he clearly mm -hmm. had to clarify he you know if he'd actually wanted people to read it and critique it and, and have something to say about it then maybe he would have said something before that point or when he maybe finished it you know so that makes but me isn't that what a that. conversation isn't that what a conversation is though i guess so sort of talking and then clarifying what Responding. you mean in relation to other people yeah. and adjusting what you mean in relation to other people yeah so, so maybe yes yeah, so maybe it does support the fact that he he wanted it to be seen by others and for it to be a discussion um mm. Because I don't think he would criticise himself like this. I don't think he sees this as a monologue, especially because he wrote it over a period of months. You know, it's to him when he's writing it, I would assume that it was like in parts, like snippets. Mm. So it felt less like a monologue and more like, uh, like a document of his, you know, like a diary or whatever, a journal yeah. as it were. So That's interesting. It's almost like it's a dialogue with the rest of his life and with mm. other people around him and it's just that we, we only get to see his side yeah and we only get you it know, in one chunk that's how it works. Too. you know if he mm. if he released it canto by canto or whatever you know it, it might have been more of a discussion and less of a monologue mm -hmm. but because we received this journal the awesome journal in one go it's it mm. does seem very much like a monologue yeah um, so before we move on to the next, next part, I'm just going to show you my favourite line. Mm. Pleasure implies hunger, but hunger implies hope. This is, that is, the mm. very fact that you need something or want something, that implies you, like you couldn't be hungry if food didn't exist. Your, the fact that your body is hungry implies the hope that you will get food. Yeah. And there's then the same can be taken for anything, which the sort of more general political or social interpretation of that given that he's just been saying man means men in action try and confine yourself to yourself if you can that is you can't you're you are not self-sufficient everyone relies on everybody else yeah that implies that because you're discontent with the way things are that implies that you on some level can change it mm. you know that you wouldn't Essentially, that if you're hungry for change, you have not yet reached reached hopelessness. You know. Yeah. So that then um, goes on to another canto, and the last canto that we'll look at, which is a very political one. Mm. So this one has been a lot more more um, abstract about politics. Yeah. And it's not just about politics, but like. I'm using politics in a very broad sense to be all of the sort of social relations and essentially politics as yourself in relation to other people um, and, and how that's organized in society, right? Yeah, yeah. It's been very abstract um, in that canto. In canto 18, um, he is more specific. Hmm. So, he uses some, um, some more Greek metaphors. Um, he's looking around at um, sort of the, looking around at where he lives and saying, um, the gray stones and heather and the sheep that breed and break the legs and die. So that's mm. morbid. The uplands now are, the uplands now as then are fresh, but in the valley polluted rivers run, the Lether and the Styx, which are um, two of the five rivers of the ancient Greek underworld. And probably the most famous ones, I'd say. Yeah, I'd say. Um, so the Letha or Lethe or however you say that one was a river of forgetfulness and Styx was a river of oaths which bound the gods and the goddess yeah. of the river was the personification of hatred. Mm. So that's fun. 
The soil is tired and the prophet's little and the hunchback bobs on a cart horse around the sodden ricks. And all of this is quite old fashioned. Yeah. Um, sort of rural language. Yeah. Um, you know, but it sort of then implies because he's talking about this in the present tense and, and saying, you know, mm. you know, the shepherd then as now was silent beside the charm, which is a, a lake. It implies that like nothing's changed, that this old fashioned language still applies. Right. It says, sing us no more ideals, no more pastorals. So these are a pastoral, um, in this set, in this case, uh, a work um, of a genre that depicts rural life in an idealized manner, manner right. typ typically for urban audiences. So, um, for example, Virgil's Eclogues. So that's more, more Latin. That's uh, a Roman, a Roman writer. Mm -hmm. So basically saying, stop singing these um, poems of like that make rural life seem beautiful yeah the country is dwin is a dwindling annex to the factory mm. squalid as an afterbirth um so industrialization basically yes. and i mean that kind of stuff is still happening now you know mm -hmm. obviously where we live is quite i'd say it's mixed it's um, mm -hmm. got a lot of surrounding rural area and yeah. you know it's being filled with houses and filled with expansion mm. and you know it's not factories but it is buildings so I feel like this yep. this is still true of today but you know Definitely, it's true yeah. of today because you know you want to accommodate all the people and you want to, to improve people's quality of life by giving them housing and available, you know, available mm. resources and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd argue here he's fairly like, I want to say anti-capitalist, but again, not in um, the same, it's in less of a sort of Anti-capitalist or anti-industrialist, but I'd say the two mm. go hand in hand. Mm. Um, there's a quote that <laughs> quite irritated me actually when I was um, researching. This is Julian Simmons, and this is um, from an essay from 1940. And he sees the speaker of McNeese's poems as quote, an ordinary man. That's capital O, capital M. This is um, the ordinary man. <laughs> and he writes, the ordinary man is not the violently class conscious worker. The number of violently class conscious workers in England just now is small. Um, the ordinary man is the manual worker who is not violently class conscious, who aspires to be a black coated petty bourgeois, the black coated petty bourgeois who aspires to be a bourgeois with a little property, the bourgeois with a little property who would like to be a big landlord. The ordinary man is everybody except the violently class conscious working class and what we still call the upper class. Mm. He doesn't say that McNeese is McNeese is always the ordinary man, but that the ordinary man is one of, is like the main speaker of the poem. Yeah. Um, and says that the most honest and intelligent adherents to this attitude, like Mr. McNeese, see themselves as lost in a changing world. And who, what do you think about that? <laughs> hmm. I would say that to call McNeese, an ordinary man, is interesting because he didn't start from being a worker. Like, he's never mm -hmm. been, you know, if the progression is to be, you know, from this thing to this thing to this thing to this thing, he, he didn't, he hasn't gone anywhere class wise. He's just, right. you know, he's been fairly well off and he's stayed that way. And to yeah. be fair, maybe he's gone down a little bit because he had to, like, you know, work and teach and stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I'm assuming he needed to do that. He couldn't just do that because he, you know, because he wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I don't know if he's... I wouldn't call him, like, a, a specific worker. But he's definitely not... I don't know if he's class... Con he is class conscious, but not violently. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's the idea that, like, Simmons at, at no point in this paragraph 
talks about class consciousness without violence. Right, you, it's you weird. don't he need to be says violent. violently class conscious. Exactly. Like, no, McNeese is not violently anything. Mm. That's no. kind of the point is like, his whole thing is that he doesn't want to take on either side. And he, and he doesn't, it's almost as if the reason, like, I get the impression that the reason he doesn't want to take on any particular side is because he doesn't want to do violence in the name of any particular cause. Mm. And so, you know, he, to say, and it's so sort of, I don't know, it just irritates me, like, mm. that Simmons, or Simons, I, don't, I might be saying his name wrong, um, insists, or seems to be insisting that class conscious workers, like the working class, as opposed to the capitalist class, right, those who work rather than those who own stuff. Yeah. Um, so that would be, um, McNeese as well, right? Mm -hmm. He's not working class in the sense that we often use it. Like he's middle class in that sense. Yeah. But he's working class in the sense that he isn't a capitalist. Like mm -hmm. he doesn't own capital or own the means of production. Um, but yeah, this idea that he is like the idea that class consciousness is inherently violent seems to be what Simmons is saying, which is really odd. Mm. But when he says do they see themselves as lost in a changing world? I don't think McNeese is lost at all. No. I think he I think he knows exactly where he's at. I mean, he's introspective and he's like mm -hmm. looking around and and seeing things for what they are, but I don't think he's confused as to his position. And like That's fair actually. Okay. He sees the world changing and he's like, Yeah, it's changing, but he's not like, What's going where where do I fit in? You know, he knows what he's doing. Mm. He's said, he's teaching, he's and he's teaching people who you know, he's realised, oh, I have this education, but actually it's not really that important in the grand scheme of things. And mm. But he's not lost. He's almost self-assured. Like he, He's almost very secure in the fact that he's teaching something that people don't necessarily need to know and that he's <laughs> in a privileged position and all that kind yeah. of stuff. He's not lost. That makes sense, actually. Yeah. yeah, I think I agree with you, actually, because I would have said he seemed lost, but actually maybe he doesn't. It's more that he is, he's worried about the future but he's secure in his, he's secure in his position, right. not knowing, not wanting to adhere to a particular ideology is not the same as not knowing your own beliefs. Right. He knows where he's at. Yeah, but the I fact that I he hasn't picked a side means that he's not caving to one thing or another thing. He, he's sure where he's at. It's yeah. just, yeah. It's just, he's also a bit, um, a bit morbid sometimes and a bit mopey <laughs> sometimes and yeah. you know like but he's not necessarily um sort of moping because he's lose he's like not sure where he fits in yeah he's not floundering right. in himself he is just very concerned about the state of the world understandably a war mm. had just begun yeah right um, and i keep saying that but like it's kind of quite important to understanding this poem <laughs> that like you know the world was changing and in a huge and you know unprecedented mm. violence was about to break out or was yeah, breaking definitely out. and he was so seeing the evidence of things. the changes and you know he, things were being yeah. ruined and and his his world was changing yeah. But yeah, definitely wasn't lost. So Julian yeah. Simmons, Simons, get out of here. <laughs> we don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I should have brought up this quote when we were talking about uh, his education, actually. Because mm. Julian Gibson says, the major events of Magnus's own life were, within limits, reasonably representative. He was born into an upper middle class family, received a traditional education, taught school, worked for a large corporation, the BBC, married twice and had two children. His interests ranged from rugby to idealist metaphysics. He enjoyed discussing current events. He liked tobacco, Irish whiskey and women. McNeese was certainly qualified in important respects to speak for the ordinary man, but that's not capitalised. He's talking, he means just, just generally. the general person. Yeah. And the frequent autobiographical passages in his work leave no doubt that he considered ex his experiences broadly representative. Which I disagree. I, I disagree too, because he definitely points out Especially when he's like, yeah, think about ancient Greece and think about all the people and then think about the slaves. Like he knows, 
he yeah he's he's aware that in history and now he's not part of the general population exactly I, yeah i'd say that upper middle class family is not representative no. and i say that as someone from a middle class family like <laughs> we, we are not representative of everybody <laughs> um right you know and, and like received I a like traditional education he went to a he went to public school. He went to a boarding school. The fact His that he had, would have had to pay to get there. Very good education in the first place. Yeah. You know, like that is not representative. It might be representative of the sorts of people he was around, and it may be representative of the sorts of people that Julian Gibson has been around. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then also, um, you know, his interests range from rugby. You're like, yep, yep, to idealist metaphysics. Your random person on the street is not into that. I'm going to tell you that right. for free, Julian. <laughs> <laughs> another one julian gibson get out uh, yeah I think... yes i i disagree with him about him being representative and i disagree with him that mcneese thinks he's representative yeah totally. he's representative in some respects there are hmm. some things that mcneese talks about that could yeah. be sort of uh like things that everybody experiences mm. but He's also Not very aware. Went to Oxford. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's very aware that, like, he's you know he he kind of jokes to himself about the fact that he knows all this stuff about classics mm. and and that it's not useful. And even at school, he knew that you know all this stuff. Or he looked back at his school experience and was like, yeah. And we know that, like, he's aware that people don't learn Latin mm. to make them you know know English the best possible way and all that kind of stuff so yeah yeah so we're kind of running out of time so would you like do you have any questions or things you'd like to point out or anything to end on um not anything in particular although um i do wonder where these people got those feelings from do you think these, that it um, was critics yeah would you think it was colored by their own life experience or like they were reading think, it through the lens of their own experience? I think everybody's opinions are coloured by their experience. Hmm. Yeah, like, I agree with that. You know, the fact that I enjoy the passages where he's talking about Aristotle and mm. talking about his time at Oxford and, you know, the fact that, like, I like all of that stuff and I don't sort of, like, you could easily be that and go, you might be self-aware, but you're still an elitist bastard. I definitely don't feel that way, but then... Right. I've enjoyed all of that stuff and you know I wouldn't say that our school was great but certainly I got to learn a lot learn at least some of that stuff yeah I mean you self-taught yourself classics so let's be real real about who's (laughs) teaching who here (laughs) (laughs) but like you know my parents like based on my family and um all that sort of stuff like I am privileged in that sense. And mm. so it makes sense that my interpretation of those passages is probably more charitable than somebody else's might be. Mm, um, maybe so. Yeah. And my interpretation is also going to be colored by my political beliefs, right? That mm. um, I am, that my beliefs are fairly left wing. And so, I say fairly left wing, really rather left wing. <laughs> um, and so, of course, a lot of, of course, a lot of the um, the way that he talks about, you know, my, my opinions on the way that he talks about politics are going to be affected by that because how can it not be, right? Right. Um, and the same way your interpretation of this is going to be coloured by your beliefs and your learning yeah, experience. Yeah, definitely. I think it is worth, I, I do think we sometimes forget um, when we're reading literary criticism or sort of cultural criticism in general to keep that in mind that the way that we're taught it at school especially is like look at this clever person who said clever things they are much more clever Mm. than you you must refer to them respectfully by their last name and you must cite Mm. your sources and do all of this as if they're as if they're gods right Right. there is there is that line in um when he's talking about his education and he says oxford crowded the mantelpiece with gods and then names a bunch of philosophers and we're kind of expected to treat critics in the same way but like no, sometimes they're wrong, mm. and all of all of the time, even the ones I agree with, they're 
beliefs, what they write, their interpretation, however hard they might try to avoid it, it is going to be coloured by their life experience. Yeah. Their views. And I would say a lot of time as well, it's a very, um, not to be harsh to all critics, but it's a very cookie cutter experience. They're all from very Mm -hmm. similar places and they've had similar educations. I'd say that's changing. It is, it is, yeah. The older the critic is, like right, the, exactly. you know, the Let's, further back you're looking, the more likely know, it is. And we know was, what type of person we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, and even now, absolutely. Mm. Like, you know, the um, educational institutions, universities especially, like, yeah. they are racist, they are classist, they are frequently misogynist. Like, yeah, it, that's you know, there are perspectives that don't, there are perspectives that are underrepresented in published criticism. Um, So that is also, yes, something to bear in mind. And I think especially at school, like you're given texts that are maybe slightly older with slightly older Mm -hmm. criticism and and the pool of criticism may be growing, you know, like, like, you know, you criticise things that are are older, but at school, they're not going to pick the 22 year olds criticism <laughs> they're gonna pick the yeah. need, need i say old white man's criticism from 40 years mm-hmm. ago you know what i mean yeah. like because it's founded in something and i use founded yeah. in quote marks but really it's just an opinion so keep your opinions away from me <laughs> <laughs> just kidding yeah. Esme, i'm happy to have all your opinions <laughs> <laughs> good, good. That, that's that's the nature of podcasts <laughs> you have to hear a lot of them <laughs> honestly <laughs> yeah okay so do, we wanna, do you want to talk about next yeah time? i was gonna say do we want to wrap this baby up so um i think that we this is part three right yep um so we are going to follow this episode with a nice little science topic of dun, 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 um more history of epidemiology and the impact of wartime cool. on epidemiology but it's going to be more modern one might cool. say um basically a bit more um related to what's going on currently in, mm-hmm. in the world there are a few places that still don't receive adequate medical uh, resources just because of the the state that their country is in and um i thought it would be interesting to discuss that especially since uh we discussed a little bit about polio previously Mm -hmm. and um the only places that still have uh, endemic polio are places that are currently experiencing um upheaval so um Mm. i thought it'd be interesting in the context of this wartime situation and obviously last science episode we would have talked about the historical impacts of war and and the epidemiology in that it's going to be interesting to talk about the more modern side because it's still happening everybody just because it's in history doesn't mean it's not still happening now so yeah that'll be mm-hmm. for the science episode next time cool mm-hmm. thank you so much for listening everybody see you next time <laughs>